Absolute zero. Yeah. And then you know, it's, you know, yeah. 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 Yeah.
A lot of this stuff might be a little bit uh, difficult to grab hold of, but we'll, we'll unpack it together. And as we unpack it, we'll be just fine. And uh, so what he's going to do is he's going to talk first and foremost about the understanding of life and death according to the Hebrew and Greek scriptures. Now that's going to be basically the Old Testament and the New Testament, okay? He's going to talk about how we understand life and death according to the Hebrew and Greek scriptures. And then he's going to talk about life and death according to the American scriptures. And you're going to say, well, what's, what's the American scriptures? The American scriptures, he's basically saying, is that's the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. And how does the Constitution and the Bill of Rights understand life and death? Then he's going to talk briefly about life and death according to the natural sciences, okay? And we're going to see how uh, there's limitations uh, to science. Now, we're going to be very, very careful. We don't want to throw science under the bus and drive over it. We want to understand the, the blessings of science, but also the limitations of science, and that's his contention. And then uh, he's going to say, talk about life and death as a consequence of relying on science only versus life and death considered ethically in this time of, of, of uh, COVID as well. Okay, so let me unpack this for you guys. If you have your sheets, we'll read through this together. Okay, number one, and uh, again, we're going to go through this. If you have questions, please make sure to ask. And uh, by the time we're done unpacking this, it's going to make, make a lot of sense for you, okay? All right, so here's what Schultz says. The life of the human being does not end with biological or irreversible brain death. Authoritative evidence for this is found throughout the Hebrew and Greek scriptures. These scriptures provide an abundance of historical and vetted evidence of resurrections culminating in the resurrection of Christ, the Messiah and Redeemer of humankind, from the dead following his crucifixion. Okay? All right, so what we want to understand is this. Let's go to our really fancy drawing board here. See how fast, well, I'm going to get pretty fast at this, you guys, all right? Look out. So what we want to understand is that life begins when? Life begins at conception. Yep, so we want to always make sure. Uh, I find it very, very interesting that uh, individuals oftentimes, and I'll visit with people who perhaps are going to be more in that realm of pro-choice, and I'll always ask them, can you please define to me when life begins? And they have a very, very difficult time defining when life begins. Um, I find it very interesting that uh, in many individuals who would, we, we'd say that believe in evolutionary thought, they can, they can say, oh, well, the Earth is, you know, 100 billion years old. Or they can just say exactly how many billions of years old that the Earth is. But when it comes to defining when human life begins, they have a tough time defining that. Now... Can we define when life begins according to science? Yes, we can. But philosophically, uh, that many individuals hesitate to do that because it would commit them to an ethic. Does that make sense? Yeah. We as Christians, we would say that life begins right there at conception. Okay? Oh boy. Remember if I touch the rest of it. Okay? So it begins at conception. Now, here's what, what he is saying. is If you ask the average person about life, they would say it begins at conception and it ends at death. Yep. So this is going to be life as we know it. Now, there's a couple of ways of defining death. If we have a lack of a pulse, right? If we have a stopping of the heart or the stopping of brain waves, we would have what? Death. Uh, I've been in hospitals uh, where we've had to pull breathing apparatuses from individuals and um, we've had to be there with the side of a loved one. I re recall one it's particularly hard in uh, Fargo with the Winter family uh, pulling all the apparatuses out of a loved one um, and we weren't causing death we we're allowing what death to happen and uh, the poor lady you know she struggled for a time and then finally she stopped breathing now what happened is when she stopped breathing the nurse came over and she did what she put her hand right her two fingers where uh -huh. on the wrist and then the neck to look for a pulse and she said, nope, we, can, we still have a small pulse. And the pulse got less and less and less. And then finally, when the pulse was done, she goes, okay, we're going to call it. And then she took out the clipboard and she wrote the time of what? Yeah. Death. Now, science will understand that death and life uh, is basically confined where? From conception to death. What we are saying, what Schultz is saying, according to us, now this is going to be, for us, we're going to say, well, of course, this makes sense. 
But, but for us to just contemplate this, that we as Christians would say, even though death happens, that there is what? Life to come, right? And so we would say that life is not contained merely between conception and death, but that life is what? Eternal, yeah, there's an eternalness to life, okay? Okay? There's an eternalness to life that life continues. Yep? But I think our life is even before conception. Because okay. in uh, Psalm 139, uh, David says, you know, before I was formed, you know me. You know, yeah, you know yeah. Me. So I would say that, that life, okay, so... so uh, life, physical life, and body and soul come together when? Now the Lord, the Lord, the Lord knows all of time, right? So He knows the beginning and the end. Um, but for us, as now, keep in mind the definition of, of of us as a human being is we have a soul and what? A body. That's what makes us alive. So soul and body come together where? At conception. So let's use that as a definition. That, that even though God foreknew us, soul and body come together at here, at conception. Now at death, what happens? There's a separation of body and soul. But we would say that the soul continues, right? Continues to exist. It doesn't cease to exist. And then after that, then what's going to happen? There's going to be a time where body and soul are going to be put back to what? Together. Together again. Okay? So what Schultz is saying is we cannot as... According to the Hebrew and Greek scriptures, we cannot merely say that life is what? From conception to death. Life is bigger than what? Yeah. Than just death. Okay? That is a Christian fundamental understanding. Okay? All right. So, uh, he says number two, note very well the reality of the resurrection. Uh, we see that from St. Luke, uh, who is a medical background. Uh, we also see this from the Acts of the Apostles. Uh, we see the, the eyewitnesses and the testimonies throughout all the scriptures pointing to the fact that life, life proceeds, uh, proceeds and precedes, continues, okay, continues after death, okay? Uh, we also see this in the Apostles' Creed. We, we confess this, right, in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in the resurrection of the dead and the life everlasting. So we confess this every Sunday that life is not merely contained in this section here, but it continues on. Okay, so that's the first thing that Schultz is wanting us to understand. Uh, now, when I say that, you, you guys as Christians, you're going to say, well, that makes sense. But we're going to see how that differs from um, a different worldview. Okay, so let's turn the page to the next page where it says, Life and Death, according to the American Scriptures. All right, so we're going to kind of do one just an overview real quick. I'll press the wrong button. Okay. Hmm, file's empty. Let's try this again. There we go. Okay. So life and death according to the American scriptures. All right, so what Schultz is pointing out here is the historical uh, scriptural datum of life, which includes life after death, what we just talked about, forms the view of life and death on which the United States was founded as a constitutional republic. So what Schultz is asserting here is this, is that the Constitution understands that life and death um, that, that life itself is not contained just from conception to death, but there's an understanding that life is bigger than just that. Okay? Um, so in ethical terms, what the scriptures say about the infinite worth of regarding the moral weight of every human life is normative, meaning morally decisive for every human being without exception universally. So what he is simply saying is this. What Schultz is saying is that life has intrinsic value because life is bigger than what we just simply see from conception to death. There's an eternal um, value. Now, we, we have to keep in mind that the very beginning, what makes humankind uh, exceptional and important is that we were originally created in what? The image of God. So we are different than what? Different from fish and plants and animals and rocks because we were originally created in the image of God. Now, we, we lost that image of God because of our sin 
and our fall, right? The sin of, of Adam and Eve, our sinful nature. But nonetheless, we still understand we were originally created in the image of God, which gives us value, okay? And so what Schultz is saying is that the American scriptures understand uh, that when it comes to uh, life and it comes to us as human beings, there is an importance to us as human beings, which is, uh, as he defines here, uh, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal and that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So unalienable rights is that there's a right that exists beyond what? The containedness of this life from conception to death, that there's something bigger uh, to life, which is ultimately a creator uh, that gives us inalienable rights, okay? All right, so he's making the assertion again that, that the uh, Old Testament Hebrew scriptures and the New Testament Greek scriptures, as well as uh, the American scriptures being uh, thus the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, the Declaration of Independence, um, have this idea, this, they draw this idea of life from the Old Testament and New Testament as well. Okay? All right, we're going to move on. Next one. Now, this is where it gets interesting. <laughs> Now Schultz goes for us to understand life and death according to the natural sciences, okay? So it's very important for us to understand uh, that the sciences, he says, from physics to biology to anthropology, do not proceed according to the scriptures, neither the biblical scriptures nor the American scriptures. Instead, the science proceed according to the canons of science and the scientific method in a non-normative and fundamentally amoral manner. Now, boy, what, is, what does that mean? So what he's saying is this, is the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution itself, they will pull that theme and that understanding of life from where? The Hebrew scriptures and the Greek scriptures. Now, science itself is not going to be pulling from what? Yeah. From the scriptures. Okay? So science itself is not pulling from scriptures. So science uh, does not proceed from the Bible and the Constitution. That makes sense? Yeah. Okay? All right. So now because of that, um, he says in number 14 here, science per se does not deal with human life as it is, either prior to death or with regard to of life everlasting. This is because scientific methodology relies upon a scientifically reductive, materialistic model of the human being. Okay? And he goes on to say here, science today sees human beings essentially as biological machines. Okay? So back to our sheet here. Let's pull this up. Science understands mankind where? Right here. That makes sense? From conception to death. That's what science understands. And science does not understand. Uh, so if you, if, to be alive is to take what? Body and soul put together. But science does not recognize what part of the human being? The soul. The soul, yep. So science does not recognize the soul. Science only recognizes what? The body. The body. Now, that's not bad. That's just, that's what science does. Um, so science understands just the body, not the soul, and science understands from conception to where? Yeah. To death. This parameter right here is what science understands. Science does not understand what? Eternal, eternal, eternal life here. So science does not understand that part. That makes sense? Okay. All right. So he says in number 15 here, Thus, we the people, as body and soul, everlasting beings that we are, are invisible to the what? Scientific, Scientific eye. Okay? And so, science does not and cannot, um, let me erase this here. Okay? So, science does not understand us as body and soul, only as what? Wow. Only as body. Okay? And so he goes on to say here, number 17, 
Consequently, the sciences are not competent to grasp, much less to educate its practitioners and adherents on how we ought to live morally, that is, ethically, not in this life and not in the life to come. So let's just pretend, let's just pretend uh, we have two people here, and I'm going to speak a little crassly, but, but to prove the point, we have two people, and let's name these two. What do we want to name these two people, you guys? So we do in confirmation. We need to name them. Jimmy. Jimmy, thank you. I was waiting for that. Jimmy. And then who, how, who do we name this person over here? Ray. Ray. <laughs> we're going to name this person Ray. Now, we're going to make Ray, uh, we're going to make Ray kind of happy, and Jimmy's going to be, what, very happy? Okay. Now, here's the thing. Science is going to answer the question of this. Let's just say, I say to you guys, I want to take, the, again, I'm going to speak a little crassly here. Let's get a different color here. I want to take the head of Jimmy and the head of Ray, and I want to what? Switch the heads on the body, okay? So we're going to take Ray's head off and put it on Jimmy's body, and we're going to take Jimmy's body and put it on Ray's body. Now, the question you're going to have, you should have two questions. The first question is this. Can we do this? Okay. Can we do this? And the second question is, should we do this? Those are two different questions. Now, you both say no to both of those. But, but science is going to answer the question, which question is science going to answer? Can, Can we? Right? So, so if, if we want to take Ray's head off and put it on Jimmy's body, and put Jimmy's head on Ray's body, and for those of you who are watching, we have Ray back there. So, uh, so, the, so when, when Ray's name was mentioned, it was just a pick on him today. Um, so science is going to answer the question whether or not we can take the head off of one body and put it on the other body. Okay? So scientific, let's just say scientifically, you know, we, we have a scientist and they say, yeah, you know, I think we can. I think we can. I think we can take Jimmy's head off and put it on Ray's body and Ray's, scientifically we can. Now, I don't think, you know, obviously I don't think we can. Um, I have heard about stories where they've attempted to do this or thinking about it, doing it, but they can't scientifically yet. Um, but the question is, so science is going to ask, ask the question of can we? And that's going to say, can we do it scientifically? But it does not answer and it cannot speak to what? Science does not have the ability of answering whether or not should we. As soon as we say, should we do this or should we not do this, we're no longer doing what? Scientific. We're no longer doing science. We are now doing philosophy and theology. Okay? We are then doing philosophy and theology. We're doing ethics. Okay, does that make sense? So, as soon as we, um, and where Schultz is going on this, as soon as we start making assertions whether we should or should not do something, we have then left the discipline of science and we are now in the discipline of morality, the discipline of, of ethics, the discipline of philosophy and theology. Okay? So what we end up, uh, so science can say, um, again, I'm going to be very blunt on this, science can say, can we uh, go inside the womb of a mother and end the life of a child in that womb? Science is going to answer, yes. yes, you can. But should we? As soon as we answer the, ask the question of should we do that or not, we have left the discipline of what? Science, and we are now in the realm of ethics, we're in the realm of philosophy, the realm of theology. Too often, in my opinion, too often times, uh, the church and theologians will jump into the realm of science, and scientists will jump in the realm of what? Theology and philosophy. Does that make sense? Well, we understand there's two different disciplines on this, okay? All right. So number 18, the key. Good thing we can't do that, Ray. <laughs> no improvement at all. <laughs> no improvement at all. Well, I was waiting for that. 
Oh, it's a good thing Ray's good for it to give a hard time. Okay, so number 17 is, is the key that we want to understand here, what, what Schultz is pointing out. The sciences are not competent to grasp, much less, okay, no, we did 17, sorry, my apologies. Number 18. In other words, the scientists speaking scientifically as scientists about what we should be doing and doing unto others in this time of COVID virus, as well as those who rely predominantly or exclusively on scientific determinations for determining a moral response to what is happening, are making decisions and setting policies on the basis of what? A reduced, abstract, merely biological and methodological amoral representation of who and what human beings are. Did you guys get that? Yeah. Okay, so what happens is this. Back to this. Okay. Getting quick at this, huh? Okay, so back to our idea here. So this is conception, goes to death. But then we understand as Christians, according to the Old Testament, the New Testament scriptures, as well as the Constitution and the Declaration, uh, they affirm this, that there is what? Eternal life, okay? So what is happening is this, is that right now what's happening, what Schultz is showing forth and his assertion he's making, is that many decisions in our American context are being made morally and ethically on the basis of what? Just this realm here. And they're failing to take consideration what? This here. And the reason why they are not taking this into consideration is because why? Because science does not what? Recognize this part here. That makes sense? So what Schultz is saying is when we are making ethical and uh, moral decisions, we're making ethical and moral decisions based upon right here. And we're not making ethical and moral decisions based upon here. Um, here and what? Here. So our theology understands life here and understands life here. Science only understands life from here to here. So if we're gonna make a moral or an ethical assertion or decision, just based upon this, we're failing to take into what? This here. That makes sense? And so Schultz has seen that many decisions that are being made ethically and morally in our present day are only being made on the basis of this right here, not all of this together. That makes sense? Okay? I see heads now. I'm gonna pause there. Any questions? Let me see if there's any questions online here. Any questions? Yes? And then there, there's like a third aspect, which is the economics. So if, if you can remove the head and switch the head, should you, but maybe somebody else will do it first, and then that, so there's also like the competition for who will do it first because somebody's going to do it. Yeah, so we do have, yeah, but, I mean, we, we, we have, there's so many things. Now, this is going to even leave, leave this. We have things such as the economics. Okay, so we have science, we have economics, we have theology, we have philosophy, um, we have sociology, we have all these different disciplines that speak to us as humans. The, the fact of the matter is this, we as human beings are very, very, very what? Complex, and yet we're at the same time we're very simple, right? We're very complex and very simple. And, and what can happen is, is two things, we can oversimplify and we can make us over complex at the same time. There's always that happy medium. But it is, again, respecting those vocations and understanding what sphere of, of understanding they give, okay? All right? All right, so let's move on here to the consequences. What Schultz points out for us, the consequences. Okay, so the consequences. So life and death consequences are relying on science in this time of COVID. He says this, the naturalistic scientific worldview, I have been arguing, is amoral. So what does the word amoral mean? Well, not able to make an assertion of morality. Again, science can say, um, can we take Ray's head off his body and put it on Jimmy's body? 
it answers the question of can we do that, but it cannot answer the question should we. It cannot answer the question should we. And that is the reason why uh, when it comes to end of life decisions, it is so important to have a hospitals actually employ ethicists. And it's important to have doctors, or not doctors, but pastors. Um, so I'll give you an example. One thing that, that I get consulted with quite a bit, and, and, and it makes me very, very happy to be able to do so, is that um, when individuals are dying, um, they, they, they will oftentimes, and I encourage you when that time comes for you, if you have a family member, talk to me. Uh, so what will happen is this, is let's just take a Jimmy as an example. A, Jimmy's what we use in confirmation all the time. We pick on Jimmy. We've given him a personality. But Jimmy is, is on, uh, uh, in ICU, and Jimmy is on uh, a ventilator machine helping him breathe, and he's on all these things that are keeping him going. And it looks at the point of, of that Jimmy is, we might need to pull these mechanisms off his body. So the question is, is this, is, is the doctor is going to say, if we take Jimmy off of this ventilation machine, we take him off of this artificial, um, uh, the artificial contraptions that, that help support life, um, if we take him off of these things, then the, then, the, then the scientist, the doctor will say, if we take him off, he will die. Okay? And, and I really appreciate our doctors at Trinity here. They will say, here's where he's at. If we, if we um, take him off, he's not going to live, he's going to die. And they will leave the decision up to who? Yeah. The family. Then the family picks up the phone and calls who? Yeah. yeah, I encourage them to call me. And so usually what happens is when they call me, now I'm in the realm of what? Pastor. And I ask them, I ask them, what does the doctor say regarding the science? So I want to know the science. What does the doctor say? The doctor says, okay, so the doctor says uh, he cannot survive without the machines. And if we take him off of those machines, those machines take him off of him, then he will die. And so if I hear that, and, I, and then I ask the other question scientifically, is there any way for him to recover and to turn around? And uh, there was one a while back, no, his, his brain is completely shut down. His brain is completely off. There's, there's, there's no way possibility. And so for me as a pastor then, then I'm going to speak morally in light of the scientific data to help give a moral what? Guidance. And so the, moral, the morality is this. Are the actions that you are doing in the hospital, are they causing death or are they allowing death? In the case of causing death, we can't what? Do those actions. If we allow death, to happen, then we are ethically fine. Because my job as a pastor is to make sure the conscience is, is at peace so that when Jimmy passes away, they don't wake up in the middle of the night uh, with, with covered in sweat saying, I killed Jimmy. Do you see what I'm saying? I want their conscience to be at peace. So the pastor helps them make a moral decision based upon scientific uh, data, right? But science cannot say the question whether you should or should not uh, remove the breathing tubes, if you will. Okay? It just can make the assertion whether or not if you remove them, will it cause death? And if the doctor says yes, then you can ask all these other questions. Was well, there any way of recovery? No, there's not. And then in light of that, then a moral decision needs to be made in the realm of theology, right? In the realm of ethics and theology. That makes sense? Okay? So science, what he's saying is science cannot make moral decisions. It's not able to make moral decisions. It can answer, can you do this? But it does not answer, should you? And so when, when, when people are making assertions in our modern day context that are moral assertions based upon science, are they acting correctly? No, they're not. Because science cannot make moral assertions. It's amoral. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. Um, he goes on to say, Schultz says this, he goes on to say, uh, in respect to everything going on with COVID, he simply, simply says here, this on number 21, that uh, when it comes to the scientific data, that uh, the scientists are still trying to learn so much about COVID. And this is one of the things that we see. We've heard so many different conflicting 
uh, statements on COVID. Um, it, it's this, or it's this, or it's this, or this, it's all over the place, because they're scientifically trying to understand the phenomenon on COVID. And the science is not completely what? Completely settled at this point. Uh, this is the reason why, just a simple illustration, the World Health Organization says that a person, now I'm not, I'm not being, uh, I'm not saying this theologically, I'm just pointing to what I've been told scientifically, that uh, you should social distance at three feet, according to the wealth, world, world, world Health Organization, uh, they say three feet. The CDC says what? Six, Six feet. Okay. Uh, so the other day, Jason and Ruth were here, and I walked up to Jason, and I walked up well, within three feet, and what did Jason do? What did you do? Back up. Back because he goes, whoa, pastor. <laughs> and I said, it was interesting. And, and, and so Jason has a Scandinavian background, so it must be the Scandinavian. But I think we social distance automatically uh, at three feet. So without even realizing, we're upholding what? The World Health Organization uh, guidelines of three feet of social distancing. And so um, that, that is inherent in our culture. But, but his point is this, the science is not completely settled, they're still, what, researching it. And he's also saying that there's other alternative scientific data out there uh, that is still being uh, examined on this, okay? Um, but he says, in the midst of all this, and I love how he says this, before the science, during the science, and after the science, there are what? The scriptures, the American scriptures and the Hebrew and Greek scriptures. So as science is trying to understand uh, the scientific, scientific data and the scientific workings of COVID, before it, in the middle, and after it, we have what? The scriptures, the scriptures that speak to us about life and death, okay? Which we cannot ignore, okay? All right. Move on to the next one. So, life and death, reconsidering ethically in this time of moral crisis. He says, to conclude, the decisions about what to do or not to do, to do unto ourselves or to do unto others, which are what? Moral questions calling for ethical discussions cannot be decided scientifically, exclusively, because of the nature of science as it is practiced today which is what? Non-moral. Okay, and so my contention is this, and the reason why I'm sharing this with you is that when we make decisions, we have to make decisions with also including the science as well as what? Our theology, as well as understanding a comprehensive view of mankind, that we're not just bodies, right? We're not just bodies, we're bodies and souls and we're not just constricted to life here from conception to death but there's something such as eternal life that makes sense okay so he says here in other words ethics lies beyond the reach and the authority of the natural sciences ethics is something that the natural sciences do not have the scientific language to speak about okay again i want to make sure we're very clear on this we're not negating science Okay, so as Christians, we're not science negators, okay? Uh, we are understanding the limitations of science and understanding its proper role. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, um, and he says very lastly, very, very last year, Therefore, in this time of COVID crisis, it is not science that we should be looking to for the parameters within which to determine whether or not to allow religious congregations to assemble. This is his whole point, what he's building to. Whether or not pastors and deaconesses can visit the sick with word and sacrament. Whether or not to assemble in our religious schools to teach the full message of Christ and his scriptures, from which the ethical and moral genius of our American way of life was formed. Okay? And then he goes on, the very last one, number 35. Ultimately, in this time of virus or plague or daily life, amoral science cannot save us morally. Salvation lies in the scriptures. Moral salvation in the American scriptures, salvation for this life, and then next from the Hebrew and Greek scriptures. So what he is essentially saying is this. Go back to our drawing board here. Okay.
Okay, so essentially what he's saying is this. If life is from conception to death, and that's all that, are, all that there is, and science then understands this right here, that we are merely what? Body, materialistic beings. If that is all that there is, then yes, we make decide decisions solely based upon what? The, the science. But because we are body and soul, and that there is what? Life to come, eternal life, that even though there is death here, okay, but that the soul goes on, and that at some future point in time, body and soul will be reunited yet again, okay, that because there are things that happen in this life that will impact and have consequences, consequences into the future, we cannot exclusively make decisions right now solely based upon what? Science. We need to make understanding of science and what? Theology. And the theology. Scripture. Yep, the theology, ethics, morality, and philosophy of the bigger picture. Okay? Does that make sense? Yes. Okay? I'm going to pause there and ask us to reflect on it. We're at 10 o'clock here. Any questions? Yes. Yes. Let's go to that, uh, should we? Uh, you got Ray and Jimmy swapping heads. Yep. Okay, now what if we come down to, uh, you're going to transplant a heart into somebody that needs it, a kidney, <clears throat> a lung? Should we? Or, you know? Um, yeah, so that's, that's where um, the, the, our church, let me just back this up, our church, Lutheran Church, Missouri Senate, Okay, um, is going. It has something called the CTCR, the Commission of CTCR, the Commission on Theological and Church Relationship. I think that's what it stands for. And this group of individuals, it's basically a group of our some of our top theologians, and they get together and they're going to ask these questions. And I'll give you a perfect example. So a couple couple uh, months ago, uh, what we saw was many churches were like us. We went. Um, Restricted Sunday church services for about five weeks. And uh, there are other churches in the United States that still haven't gotten back together to meet again. And you look around the room, I mean, we have quite a few people in here. And our services are about 60 to 70% now, which is neat to see. But what happened was, uh, with the advent of technology, many churches for the first time, now we've been doing this for a while, they were thrown into this idea of let's broadcast our services uh, through the internet. So this is a new venture for many churches. So they, uh, we were set up in a position where we had already been doing this for a couple of years, so it wasn't a, a huge revolutionary idea for us to do our services online. But they did it for the first time. So then what happened was, is this. Uh, the question that came about, okay, uh, can we broadcast our services online? Yes. Can we speak the words of institution uh, into a camera? Yes, we can. Uh, can we uh, lead a church um, as a pastor? Can we preach through a camera to our uh, ears to hear? Yes, we can. So then the question came up, well, can we do online communion? Okay. And you guys say no right away. So I'm glad you, you said no. I, I, would say, I would say absolutely no. Now, the, once we enter into that question, can we, can we do, can we, could we organize online communion with a camera on I guess the question, can we? I guess perhaps we can, but, but then, then ask the question is, should we? And then if we do that, what is it? Is it really communion? Is it not communion? Uh, what, what, what? So that's where we have the CTCR that comes into play and looks at the, the events going on and sees all the technology and the things that are going on and they ask the question, okay, can we do this? Well. Technologically, we can, but should we do this, and what is it we're actually doing? So you have to ask those further questions, okay? Um, so that's where the CTCR comes along and asks those questions. Um, so the CTCR goes and looks at all the different things that are happening in this world, 
and asks those difficult questions, should we do this? And if we do this, what are we doing theologically? How does this influence our theology? What are the ramifications for the future? We have to keep in mind, okay, so we have to keep in mind, everyone, that the decisions we make today on certain things in the church, okay, theologically, will have what? Could perhaps have negative or positive consequences for the next hundred years. Me as a pastor, I want you guys to know this, I take this not, very, this not lightly, I take this very seriously. The things that I do as a pastor, okay, in this church and in our services on Sunday, can have lasting consequences either positively or negatively for the next hundred years, okay? Not only that, what I do and how I conduct myself as a pastor can have positive or negative consequences for what? All of eternity. You see? And so, I'll be very honest with you, where I'm struggling right now is, and this is a tension that I'm struggling with, and, and I'm still working this out. We have individuals, okay? We have individuals right now in the nursing home, okay? Individuals in the nursing home who are um, on hospice. We have one individual on hospice and a couple that are really close. They're on hospice. They're in the nursing home. And in the nursing home, the nursing home has actually, now I, I'm not pointing the finger at nursing homes, because the nursing home is following CDC guidelines. They are restricting pastors from entering in to see them on the basis of what? On the basis of the science. So Pastor Roth went to a nursing home uh, this week, and Ruth was checking whether or not we could get in. They said no, and what did Roth do? He went anyway. He went anyway. And Roth was like, this person needs to see me because they're on hospice and they're going to be soon, what, passing away. And I want to take care. I know that their body is, what, dying, but I want to prepare their, what, soul, soul for Jesus and make sure that them as a human being, as body and soul, are prepared for the life to come. So Roth was like, I'm going to go anyway, and I'm just going to show up at the door and see if I can get in. He showed up, and did he get in? No. Now, for me as a pastor, I can understand, and I'm not angry at the nursing homes. They are following the protocol of what? Protecting what? The body. The body. But as a pastor, I'm also concerned about what? Soul. The soul. And the reason why I am is because we understand not just this, but we understand what? Eternal. The whole package. That makes sense? Okay. I probably shouldn't admit this here online, but there, there's been a couple times where uh, a while back I, there was an individual who was not doing well in the hospital, and um, uh, I just put a mask on, washed my hands, and I just went right into the ER, and I walked past everybody, and I went right up to their room, and I figured, well, they'll have to kick me out, because was, I, was, I felt it was that important to be there for what? The soul. The soul. And I came to that person and um, held their hand, and they just wept. They just wept and cried. They hadn't seen uh, family members or a pastor for quite some time. And uh, I was willing to take the consequences. I realized what it was. Now, physically, I was feeling great. I didn't have any, any symptoms or any, any sickness. I washed my hands, put a mask on, respected what? The body, but I came for the sake of ministering here and here to come. That makes sense? Okay. So that is what Schultz is actually pointing out here for us to consider, that when it comes to the church, many individuals are telling churches, and I think, and, and again, this, there, there's, there's a balance to all this, but I think it is incorrect to tell a church to shut down on the basis of what? Just this. Now, we, we shut down on Sundays. We, we restricted for about five weeks. Because I felt as a pastor and visiting with the elders and the council, I felt five weeks while offering communion during the middle of the week was not going to be detrimental to what? I figured we could handle it as a church. But to shut down for three months, four months, um, that would have negative consequences where? Here and potentially where? Here. That makes sense? Okay. All right. Any other questions here? Yeah. You know, it's almost like science does recognize the body and soul somewhat because 
they recognize that when you're letting people die alone, or, you know, people probably could recover, but since they're so disconnected from people and faces, you know, that also kind of drives, it's so connected, you know, the body and the soul, even, even in the scientific realm, you would think that they, yeah. So what happened? Um, so what happened was um, we had we had. Uh, well, I'll just use an example because this is public information here. It's not breaking confidentiality. Uh, Dolores Shibi. Uh, she was. A, I loved her. <laughs> Great gal. Um, I got a phone call when uh, we did Dolores's funeral. What about three, four weeks ago? I got a phone call from. Uh, it's, it used to be called Manor Care. What is it called right now? Rehab something. Something rehab, yeah, Medicare. I got a call from uh, one of the nurses up there, directors up there, and they said, you know, Dolores isn't doing well. She's probably got about three, four days to make it. And guess what? They called me, and I got to what? Go see Dolores. And so when I got to the, the front desk, I had to answer all these questions. I had to sanitize my hands. I had to put a mask on. They had to take my temperature. They had to do all those things, which was absolutely great. And then I went, I was able to see her, what, four times right before she what? That's why, I think, no, it was that, three times. Three times right before she passed away. For the sake of what? Preparing her for this. So I say kudos to them because they recognize that the body was failing and they also recognize there's a place and time that they were limited and that there's a spiritual component to it, that there's something more than just the body and thus they called me as a pastor to come and what? Prepare her for this, for eternal life. That makes sense? So I say kudos to them. That was really good to see. The hospital right now, too, the hospital is letting pastors in um, with masks and so forth and, and sanitizing, which is good to see. So that's neat. So this, the reason why I'm teaching this to you guys and we're looking at this is because um, I don't think we're out of the woods with COVID, Okay. And uh, as a church, um, we'll have to see what happens in the future. Uh, but this is going to be uh, what I'm going to be wrestling with as a pastor. And what I want you to be wrestling with and thinking about as a church and leadership is understanding we cannot solely make a decision on the basis of what? The body. Yep. Now, we don't, again, we're not going to go the opposite spectrum where we're going to what? Be science deniers. We want to respect those in the scientific community. Uh, they're following their vocation, but understanding that that's one aspect of the vocation that there's what? A, a greater understanding of human life and there's other disciplines that speak to the context as well. Okay? I'm going to see if there's any questions online here. we got 24 people watching with us. That's kind of neat to see. Okay? All right. We got two minutes. Any other questions? Well, here's the thing. Um, so the question is this. What happens if, if a person dies and we as a pastor can't go see them? Um, well, number one, we remember our strong baptisms. Okay? So we remember our strong... We have to keep in mind there's no such thing as emergency communion. Okay? There's emergency baptisms. Okay? But if for some reason I get to a person and I'm going to bring communion and I get there and they passed away and they didn't have communion, um, have I failed as a pastor? No way. Their baptism is strong. Their baptism is what claims it. So be keep in mind with our liturgy. When we do a baptism, do we put a benediction at the end? Do we put like, so I baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. And then we put, then we put a nice benediction and we, we stop it. No, baptisms are left open. Okay? So baptisms are left open. So we baptize here. Okay? So we baptize here. So baptism happens. And then at the funeral, you know what's the first thing we do at a funeral? What do we pick up with? The first thing we do in a funeral is we start with baptism. So the thing that bookends us as Christians is that we're baptized into Christ. And so when we are first born, we're baptized into Christ. And there's no benediction. There's no like, you're baptized and then boom, it's done. No, you're baptized and it's open. And why is it open? So when you die, the first thing we pick up on is what? Where it all started. 
We start with baptism here. At what? At death. And so baptism is what holds us. Now, here's the reason why pastors want to get in to visit with people on their deathbed. Satan has this nasty little way of attacking us on our deathbeds. He has a way of digging up all the skeletons in the closet and dangling them before us. I don't know why that is, but what, what, I, what I find more than anything else as a pastor is I've, I've done a lot of ministry of people in the hospital who are the strongest of Christians, you would think. They're just strong. But at the end of life, tremendous doubt and fear and anxiety set in. And so I've had individuals say, I, you know, uh, this sin of the past that's been haunting them for years comes up. Or, you know, have I done enough good things? And that's where the doctrine of predestination comes in, where the pastor comes in and says, no, you haven't done enough, but Jesus has. And Jesus is going to hold you tonight as you fall asleep in his arms. You're going to fall asleep in Christ, and he's going to what? See you through death. And so I've been very aggressive at, at, at the side of a bed of, of individuals. Uh, as a pastor, ministering the gospel to fight against what? Doubt and the attacks of the devil. So as a pastor, you always want to make sure to get there at the end of life so that you can, what, firmly and boldly proclaim Christ in that shadow of that death, in the shadow of death, right? Okay? So um, if you don't get there, we, we, we trust in, 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 in baptism to hold them, but it, we want extra security and care uh, for a person. And that's the reason why we do hospice too, right? We call them hospice. They come in to care for the body, to help the body with pain management and so forth. So they can die a very honorable death. Yeah. Okay. All right. We're at ten fourteen, so let's conclude there. Um, take these sheets home uh, if you can. Feel free and uh, read over them if you want. But I think it's the most excellent, most excellent work done by uh, uh, Dr. Schultz on this subject. Uh, it's just very, very good, good thoughts for us to consider. Very helpful as well. All right, so let's stand. And let's have closing prayer, which is Luther's morning prayer. Let us pray. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have kept me this night from all harm and danger. And I pray that you would keep me this day also from sin and every evil that all of my doings in life may please you. Pray to your hands, I commend myself, my body and soul and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Amen, amen. All right, God bless you guys. Good to see everyone out.